Mention the name Eric Mashwitz nowadays, and the likely reaction is Eric who? But if you go on to say he wrote the lyrics for A Nightingale Sang in Berkeley Square and these foolish things, then most of us will smile and recall with affection a couple of the most romantic songs ever written. But as we shall discover, there was much more to Eric Mashwitz than the ability to write sophisticated lyrics. As an administrator in the early days of BBC Radio and Television, he was responsible for a host of popular programmes, from In Town Tonight to the Black and White Minstrel Show. As a writer, he contributed to many escapist romantic musicals, Good Night Vienna, Love from Judy, Summer Song and Balalaika. His private life was pretty hectic. A spy during the war, numerous girlfriends and a turbulent marriage to Hermione Gingold. I had to write a song in 24 hours to fill a gap in a review I was preparing for the BBC. It was Sunday morning. A title came to me over breakfast. My midday, still in pyjamas, I had dashed off a whole lyric, verse and three choruses, and was telephoning the result to my composer, Jack Strachey. By six o'clock, he had a melody, and we met to compare notes. Everything seemed all right, though Jack wasn't all that enthusiastic about the title. Two evenings later, the song had its first broadcast. That title, by the way, was These Foolish Things. A cigarette that bears the lipstick traces An airline ticket to romantic places And still my heart has wings These foolish things remind me of you a tinkling piano in the next apartment Those stumbling words that told you what my heart meant A fairground's painted swing These foolish things remind me of you You came, you saw, you conquered me When you did that to me I somehow knew that it had to be the winds of March that make my heart a dancer A telephone that rings, but who's to answer? Oh, how the ghost of you clings These foolish things remind me of you Elizabeth Welsh Eric Mashwitz was born on the 10th of June 1901 to an Australian mother and a Polish father whose family had settled in Birmingham towards the end of the last century. The family business, by the way, involved what was delicately described as sanitary pottery, and Eric's father had the dubious distinction of installing the first B-Day in Birmingham. He also introduced his son to the delights of the stage. My father, who adored the theatre, took me regularly from the tender age of seven to one or other of the city's music halls. And on the way home in the horse bus that changed its perspiring team at the five ways, I would be humming the melodies from a show that for three shillings and sixpence a head had given us a minimum of a dozen variety acts. And next, of course, came musical comedy. Lip to lip, cheek to cheek, girls are girls, men are weak. When a romance has just begun, dancing is something more than fun. Lip to lip, cheek to cheek, girls are girls, men are weak. When a romance has just begun, dancing is something more than fun. Marilyn Hill Smith and Neil Jenkins singing the lyrics Eric Mashwitz wrote for Franz Lehar's The Count of Luxembourg. And he was to write the English-language versions of many other Viennese operettas, which are still performed by amateur societies throughout the country. With his background, it's not surprising that during his school days at Repton College and later at Keyes College, Cambridge, Eric should appear in and write material for end-of-term shows, including the Cambridge Footlights Review. After graduating, he tried various jobs, including one in the theatre as an assistant stage manager. It was sacked after four days for incompetence. 
He then turned to publishing and promptly fell in love with an actress with two young children who was married to his boss, Michael Joseph. But this didn't deter Eric. <laughs> and I ran away with Eric Mashwitz, who was then working for Hutchinson's, and so was my husband. I met him at a party, and I was so fed up with my sordid marriage, and he knew all sorts of amusing people, and I had a lot of fun going out and about with him. And uh, I was very unhappy, and the children were screaming, and oh, it was very sordid. So I upped and ran away. My father, who was divine, came and saw me off at the station and bought me newspapers and magazines. He was a divine man. And we went to the south of France and everything was wonderful. And uh, then we came back to England and my parents, my mother and his mother and father, were very shocked that we should be living together and insisted on our getting married. The moment we got married, we hated each other and left. <laughs> Which was awful, wasn't it? Oh, dear. As though I was born in Australia, and known there as Millicent Brown, no one could call me a failure. Under I was, but not down. And Millie, I said, you've got plenty of push. One night of love is worth two. In the bush, queen of song, queen of song. I'm the reason the tenors go wrong. When they're giving a gala at Milan, La Scala, I pick up my band parts and totter along. Oh, la la, I'm a star. You can tell by my uh, je ne sais quoi. One night at the Met, I was singing Lucia when I screamed in the mad scene so loud and so clear that I brought down the house and the gloss chandelier. Queen of song, tra la 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 Although Hermione Gingold didn't look back on her marriage to Eric with any great affection, she was not averse to performing his lyrics in review, as that 1983 recording shows. When first married, the couple found it hard to make ends meet, despite the fact that Eric wrote a novel which got on a bestseller list. But shortly after the general strike of 1926, he had a fortuitous meeting with a friend from his Cambridge days. I was walking with a very thin pair of shoes along a very hot pavement of the Strand when I met Lance Seafking, of course afterwards became a very famous programme producer, who told me that he was at the BBC and he said to me, well, if you've got nothing to do, why don't you come along as well? I said, is it easy as that? And he said, oh, well, of course, it's perfectly easy. I'll take you in to see the controller. And I was taken round the corner and whisked upstairs. He asked me a few questions and found out I'd been to a university and written a couple of books and done a certain amount of travelling. And then he said, well, before we decide anything, I think it'd be a good idea if you came along one evening and gave a talk, uh, you know, just to see well, you know, whether you like us here and whether you like the whole idea. So that was duly agreed, and I came along, and uh, I sat in a studio in front of a very strange-looking microphone, and uh, I delivered my talk with great aplomb. And I didn't hear any more until a week later I got a, a letter appointing me assistant head of outside broadcasting at the magnificent sum of £325 a year. Before long, Eric was introduced to George Posford, a young composer who just left the Royal College of Music, and together they wrote a song which not only won a competition, but was destined to be recorded by Bing Crosby. Lazy day, when spring and summer meet. Lazy day, within a woodland sweet. My way I'll be wending, spending a lazy day. Lazy day, a day to drift and dream. Let me stray. Where water lilies gleam Neath the willows bending Spending a lazy day Through green fields I want to roam Under a friendly sky Green fields whispering of home And happy days gone by Lazy day, 
beside the only one far away Where we can watch the sun or the hills descending Handing a lazy day Very shortly after I joined uh, OB's, the uh, editor of the Radio Times, a charming character called Walter Fuller, yes. uh, who was a brilliant man but no sort of organiser, finally put paid to the organising side of his work by losing the complete proofs of the Radio Times for one week in the tube on the way to the printers. So it was decided to appoint a managing editor to be a sort of nanny to him. <laughs> and as I had... Uh, done a certain amount of writing and had been for a while on the Sunday Times as, as a journalist, I was suddenly made the managing editor. And then rather tragically, about three or four weeks after that, he died suddenly. Yes. And I became a temporary editor and then the full editor, which I was for seven years. Eric wasn't glued to the editor's chair. He found time to work on the creative side of broadcasting with a man who, to all intents and purposes, invented radio drama, Val Gilgood. I think we were to some extent, licensed clowns, shall we say. Most of the people at program boards were very, very serious about their work and adopted a slightly overpoweringly serious attitude towards it. And Eric particularly was enormously gay. He had this fantastic vitality and liveliness and an enormous power of invention. And as we were both, to some extent, connected with the theatre, one way or another, I think our colleagues found a certain amount of satisfaction in giving us a free hand to amuse ourselves and sometimes I hope to amuse them. When George Postford and I wrote Goodnight Vienna, we were commissioned to do so by the BBC. Goodnight Vienna was in fact the first musical play to be written specially for radio. After shaky performances from the Savoy Hill Studios, the film rights were bought, and in sober fact, it became the first British musical talkie. The heroine, a delicious young lady by the name of Anna Needle. The hero, a long-legged charmer by the name of Jack Buchanan. Good night, Vienna. You city of a million melodies. Our hearts are thrilling to the strain that you play From dawn till the daylight dies Good night, Vienna Where moonlight fills the air with mysteries And eyes are shining to the gypsy guitars That sing to the starry skies Enchanted city of Columbine and Piero We know the magic of your spell Of our romances you're the hero Now is the time to say farewell Good night Vienna Now lovers kiss beneath your linden tree the world is waiting on the edge of the day Just waiting to say good night Good Night Vienna went on to become a professional stage play. I must admit that as such it wasn't a great success. When I asked the manager of one of the theatres in which it appeared, how is it doing, he replied succinctly, How is Good Night Vienna doing in Lewisham? I imagine about as well as Goodnight Lewisham would be doing in Vienna. A comment like that cuts you down to size. One girlfriend too many caused his marriage to break down in 1929, as Hermione Gingold was to tell her friend Anne Clements Eyre. She discovered Eric was really a bit of a womanizer. They were living at Pembroke Walk Studios at the time. She came home on a Saturday night after being on tour with the play, rushed back to London to see Eric, and Eric was not in the flat. Um, Brian Mickey, who was staying there with them at the time, she said, where's Eric? And rather shamefaced, he said, well, Eric's out. And she said, where? With a woman? Yes. And Hermione found that Eric had really been unfaithful to her with many ladies, not only with her best friend, but also her younger cousin, who was 
about 19 at the time and of course it, it was a great blow to Hermione. Hermione had been faithful to him during the marriage and uh, um, her life rather changed after that. He must have been a difficult man for a girl to cope with a, a kind of um, brilliance and uh, an average in everything he did. But he was always telling us stories. He used to drift into the office and flick his braces and put his feet up on the desk and say, I mean, once I visited my mistress in Vienna, he would have a mistress in Vienna, wouldn't he? It wouldn't be Walsall or something in Vienna. He said she was a ballet dancer. He, he, he brought sunshine with him in a curious way. He, he was a romantic man. He, he thought that, the, that, that life is really pretty girls and champagne. And he really did think it. Frank Muir. Countless pretty girls were to fall for the charming, six-foot-three, good-looking and elegant Eric Mashwitz throughout his life. In 1933, the BBC's Director-General, Sir John Reith, appointed Eric the first-ever Director of Variety and installed in the brand-new, purpose-built broadcasting house, Eric set about devising light-hearted programmes. One was Café Colette, in which he created in a basement studio such a genuine French cafe atmosphere for his singers and musicians that listeners wrote fan letters addressed to Café Colette, Paris, France. Another programme he invented lasted for 27 years. This is the BBC Home Service. Once again, we stop the mighty roar of London's traffic, and from the great crowds, we bring to you some of the interesting people who've come by land, sea, and air to be in town tonight. In Town Tonight had over a thousand editions, and was in 1954 the first radio programme to be broadcast simultaneously on television. 1936 was an auspicious year for Eric Mashwitz. He was awarded the OBE for services to broadcasting, and with Jack Strachey, wrote the timeless and profitable These Foolish Things. Thirty years later, Eric acknowledged that it was still earning him royalties of a thousand pounds a year. Another money spinner was to be a stage version of a radio operetta he had written with George Posford and Bernard Grun. I remember Hermione telling me about the first night of Eric's musical Balalaika. She saw Eric at the back of the stalls and the curtain came down, enormous applause, and she saw Eric from the back of the stalls calling out, Author! Author! And then he ran down to the front and up onto the stage and looking extremely surprised, then took a bow. <laughs> when the melancholy shadows fall my heart is melancholy too Then I hear the balalaikas call And life is gay and bright and new At the balalaika Where there is magic in the sparkling wine And mellow music in the candles have a rendezvous at the Balalaika. Who knows what ecstasy tonight may bring, what lovely melody my heart may sing before the night is through. I hear a violin, a haunting gypsy voice. Sighs its strangely tender song. I know that I belong at the Balalaika. Oh, let me linger there till break of day, where hearts are 
young and balalaika's play, I have a Nelson Eddy, who starred in the film version of Balalaika. Despite the fact that Balalaika's producer had fled the country, owing three quarters of a million pounds, the show went on to be an enormous hit, with productions all over the continent. This success resulted in the offer of a lucrative contract as a screenwriter with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. So Eric resigned from the BBC in June 1937 and made his way to Hollywood. He thought he was going to write the film treatment of Balalaika, but this task was farmed out to seven others and Eric found himself adapting Goodbye Mr Chips for the screen instead. It starred Robert Donat. What do you think of Brookfield? Oh, it's, it's big, sir. You'll like it, though, when you get used to it. It's not half such an awful place as it seems the first day. A bit afraid of it, I expect. A bit, sir. So was I, to begin with. But that's quite a while ago. Sixty-three years, to be exact. Try one of those sponge cakes. I'm afraid that's the bell for call over. You'll have to go. Oh, must I, sir? I'm sorry. Just walk by the master and call your name. Don't let it scare you. Oh, it won't now, sir. School doesn't seem half so bad after that lovely tea. Much to the astonishment of other writers content to be paid for sitting around whilst dust gathered on their typewriters, Eric decided after six months to return to England, although he'd missed the social life, not to mention intimate friendships with such beautiful actresses as Greer Garson and Anna May Wong. Back in London, he began work on a musical with a Hungarian setting to be called Paprika, but which turned out to be anything but a hot property. Undaunted, he set about revising the show with a new title, Magyar Melody. The composers, George Posford and Bernard Grun, asked Manning Schoen to contribute, and he and Eric provided their new star, Binny Hale, with this show-stopping number. Music for a man, just a song for a man, heavenly tune, stolen from spring, made for two hearts to sing. For a man has the lilt of a dog, play violin, haunting and gay, stealing our hearts away. Words that are sweet would complete the refrain, so just repeat, I adore you again and again. Lovely note, let it run, hear how it swings, heart must have wings, when there is music for a man. The Times critic considered the revised show no longer slow, that the humour had been sharpened, and that Magyar Melody could be warmly recommended. It became part of broadcasting history, as it was the first musical play ever transmitted live on BBC television in 1939. Eric Mashwitz was 38 when war broke out nine months later and he worked for a while in Liverpool as a government censor in the post office. At the start of the London Blitz, a review at the Comedy Theatre called New Faces contained one of Eric's most enduring lyrics, set to music by Manning Sherwin. It was performed by a young actress whose star quality Eric had spotted at the Liverpool Playhouse, Judy Campbell. Eric sent me round to see our singing teacher, Italian, 
And when he heard that we were opening in about ten days, he said, forget it, and gargle with port. <laughs> and so I gargled with port, and I came on, and it's quite extraordinary doing a solo spot for the first time. It's just you and them out there in the dark, and it's a very extraordinary feeling. I used to go down to the footlights and say, when true lovers meet in Mayfair, so the legends tell. Songbirds sing, winter turns to spring. Every winding street in Mayfair falls beneath the spell. Look out that little old record. <laughs> that certain night, the night we met, there was magic abroad in the air. There were angels dining at the Ritz, and a nightingale sang in Barclay's well. I may be right, I may be wrong, but I'm perfectly willing to swear. That when you turn and smile at me, I might think else and then walk away. At the end, I remember running off and just running all the way down to my dressing room and somebody coming after me and saying, come back, come back. And it was quite wonderful. And it did take off. In a, and what's lovely is that people remember it to this day. Eric joined the army in 1940, and his service career turned out to be as varied and full of incident as his civilian life. As an officer in the intelligence corps, he was taught how to handle high explosives and blow up bridges. He was posted to New York to keep an eye on what the Americans were up to before they joined the war in 1941, his cover being that of a famous writer. Back home, he lectured on the technique of broadcasting propaganda to the enemy and was responsible for organizing thousands of leaflets which called upon the Germans to surrender to be dropped over occupied Europe by the RAF. And he was still writing songs like this one. Although some people say he's just a crazy guy To me he means a million other things for he's the one who taught this happy heart of mine to fly. He wears a pair of silver wings. And though it's pretty tough, the job he has to do, I wouldn't have him change it for a king. An ordinary fellow in a uniform of blue, he wears a pair of silver wings. I'm so full of pride when we go walking, every time he's home on leave. He with those wings on his tunic, me with my But when I'm left alone and we are far apart, I sometimes wonder what tomorrow brings. For I adore that crazy guy who taught my happy heart to wear a pair of silver. Anne Shelton singing a song written by Michael Carr and Lieutenant Colonel Eric Mashwitz before he was seconded to an Anglo-American film unit as story editor for True Glory, which was to tell the official version of the D-Day landings and the subsequent Allied advance. Some years later, he recalled this period in a Christmas radio broadcast. The scene is a fire station during the Blitz. I have called there to see my composer friend George Prosford. We are chatting with the crew over cups of tea while in a corner George improvises on the piano. 
One of the youngsters talks about his recent honeymoon and the thrill of his one and only week in a big hotel. Suddenly the warning goes. There's a raid on, incendiaries, and in a few moments the place is magically empty. They have all gone except for George, who is left on telephone duty. That rather touching honeymoon reminiscence is with us still, and by the time the all clear sounds, we have written a song for Vera Lynn to make famous. Such a big hotel, a very grand one Right upon the avenue We could not afford it But sweet, I just adored it My very first and only rendezvous Five hundred and four So sweet a room So strange and new It was romance A dream come true That perfect honeymoon Alone with you The key in the door We hadn't dared to ask the price That kind of thrill Can't happen twice And who could bargain over oh, paradise in room 504 The lovely night The starlight above The sleeping town below And in the dark You say Don't live there anymore But still in memory I adore The sweetest room I ever saw A seventh heaven on the old fifth floor As the war drew to a close, Eric found himself responsible for setting up a radio station, BFN, the British Forces Network, with headquarters in Hamburg. Something else which had to be organised was a divorce from Hermione Gingold. I have no head for dates. It was awful. I had to go into court and uh, remember all sorts of dates when I first met him, when we first uh, had a row, when I decided to leave him. And it was terrible. I couldn't remember one date. And the poor lawyer was doing curious things with his fingers, you know, trying to hold up his fingers. And it looked like those racing touts, you know, <laughs> tic-tac men. However, eventually the judge, laughing rather, gave me a divorce. It was all right. So, in 1945, Eric was free at last to marry his longtime girlfriend, Phyllis Gordon. She ran this... Uh gay 90s drinks 
club, very nice, right on the corner of Bond Street and, and Conduit Street. And it was a tall, thin, red building with a cupola at the top. And Dennis and I had the top floor, and we used to work there. So we used to occasionally go down for drinks, but we weren't drinky, because you can't, we were doing our sort of work. It was very businessman. I, I learnt a lot of dialogue from it. They used to say, um, uh, have the other one, old boy, you can't fly home on one wing. To his regret, Eric Mashwitz had no children of his own, and so he was delighted to take responsibility for his wife's nephew, Crawford Gordon, after the death of the boy's father. We were terribly close, terribly fond of each other, and very different. We were poles apart. But he taught me everything I knew about the value of people. You asked me uh, what Eric was like as a family man, but I wouldn't describe him as a family man. I'd describe him just as a people man. And he always taught me that everybody counted. <laughs> That was Lester Ferguson, singing the title number of the show he starred in at London's Palace Theatre in 1948. Eric wrote the book and lyrics, Hans May supplied the music, and Carissima ran for a respectable 466 performances. It was followed in 1949 by Belinda Fair. In the cast was an ambitious young man who'd later become an award-winning television writer and director, responsible for shows such as Dad's Army and A Lower Low. David Proft. Belinda Fair didn't work. Uh, it, it flopped. Uh, although we toured around London trying to make it a success, and, and Eric was always there making speeches to sort of jolly us on. We went um, on, on tour, and uh, my brother and I sort of rewrote it and did what they called gave it a coat of funny paint. And uh, Eric very generously uh, gave me part of his percentage, though I can't think of music enamored of the sort of stuff that I wrote for him because it was very pantomime, but it got laughs, and, and you know, he, he was very tolerant about that. Eric's generosity to David Croft didn't stop there. Later, he was to help him gain a foothold in BBC television. Eric had more than his fair share of flops in the post-war years. Romance in Candlelight and Happy Holiday, an adaptation of Arnold Ridley's play The Ghost Train, both fell by the wayside. He's also gone down in theatrical history as the adapter of a French farce, 13 for Dinner, which managed only one West End performance. Nevertheless, he still managed to come up with a hit or two. When you fall for someone sweet and give your heart away Every single time you meet it's windy shopping day Diamond bracelet, coat of mink, the biggest car they've got You go crazy and you feel You'd like to buy the lot and a million, it's a great sensation Keeping cash in circulation I'm not saving up like Tom Dick or Hank I've got no money wasting time in the bank Tip goes a million, gonna start a party Dish the dollars like a cloud Easy come and easy go Don't be dumb but spend all your dough and a million and a million million Percy Pig is in town The unmistakable George Formby who in 1951 starred in Zip Goes a Million which had music by George Posford and was Formby's first stage musical 
One of Eric's projects at this time never saw the footlights, as the Lord Chamberlain, the official theatre censor, was not prepared to allow the characters of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert to be heard singing in Birthday Bouquet. Eric must have been more than a little miffed when two years later Anna Eagle was permitted to portray a singing Queen Victoria in the glorious days, as Her Majesty only dreamt she was singing. Eric was on safer ground in 1952 when he turned Jean Webster's book Daddy Longlegs into a musical. Love from Judy means Judy loves me And that means more than I can say Just three words at the end of a letter But they're words that could not suit me better from Judy means Judy loves me And so my heart is young and gay Oh, what joy those words bring Winter turns into spring Judy loves me and that's every I've had nothing to fear Since I've heard of my dear daddy My skies have been clear since I've known that I'm near Daddy Longlegs. I thought that life had passed me by and I was losing hope. But now the world's a gay collide of gold. Oh, my love is right here in this letter to dear Daddy Longlegs. Someday he'll appear and I'll meet my own dear daddy long way. You're on my mind and in my heart, although you're out of sight. As I turn off the light and wish dear daddy long go. The music and lyrics for Love from Judy were written by two young Americans, Hugh Martin and Jack Gray. And in that excerpt from the original cast recording, we heard Bill O'Connor and Jeannie Carson. Eric claimed that he discovered Jean Carson, who became a star overnight. It was Eric's interest and concern for fellow composers which made him such an active member of the Performing Rights Society. Later, he helped found the Songwriters Guild of Great Britain and became its chairman. Ronnie Bridges was an early member. It was thought necessary to set it up because of the preponderance of American material that the BBC were then using on radio compared with the British material, which was perhaps not quite so good, admittedly. Uh, we didn't produce so many Cole Porters and Irving Berlins, but our material was good enough to warrant a much bigger share than it got on the BBC. I do not believe that British writers have lost the art of writing popular songs, though many have become jaded and discouraged by the unequal struggle. There must be other reasons for the British song being so sadly in the doldrums, the principal being unfair American competition and over-exploitation, which the BBC has encouraged. And something must be done about this. I am convinced, reluctantly, that only a quota will work. Part of a letter Eric Mashwitz fired off to the then chairman of the Writers Guild in 1951, and it worked. Eventually, the corporation agreed to play a suitable quota of British compositions. In April 1958, Eric returned to the BBC as head of light entertainment television. He was certainly a new broom, as Bill Cotton and Frank Muir discovered. Ronnie Waldman, the previous head of light entertainment, had been a very distant man. I mean, he, you know, you made an appointment with Ronnie for a week on Thursday, you know. Um, on the other hand, Eric threw open the door, chatted to everybody all the time, come in, you know, and, do, and he also instituted kind of uh, cocktail parties with the four the producers and things, which I believe he did at his own expense. 
he led well from the front. I mean, he was the funniest of us all and the nicest. And in the weekly departmental meetings, he referred to a hundred or so producers and people, you know, as his, his ragged army. You know, we would have followed him anywhere, absolutely anywhere. It's that sort of management, fizzy management, is a kind of off-the-wall fizziness which makes everybody want to work for you and for the program, and, and it's a thing of the spirit. And Eric had that in abundance. It was wonderful. He was very thrilled to go to uh, Montreux, uh, to the festival. And uh, I think with a great deal of campaigning and machinations on Eric, he managed to get the Golden Rose. And uh, he was wonderfully thrilled about this, and as, as were the whole BBC. It was a great triumph. It's one of the very first of the uh, Montreux festivals. And uh, we won. Give me a good old man, me saw, one that I can sing down on my knee. Oh, give me a good old man, me saw, with an old fashioned mellow. You know me, I'm your little boy. Oh, give me a good old mammy song. And mammy, you know what I do. Mammy, I'll sing about you. Yeah. The Golden Rose was awarded for the Black and White Minstrel Show. And under Eric's guidance, Pearl Carr and Teddy Johnson won the Eurovision Song Contest with Sing Little Birdie. He introduced many other popular programmes such as What's My Line, Jukebox Jury, Jimmy Edwards in Wacko and Hancock's Half Hour. Such were the demands of his work, Eric had no time for writing. Indeed, four years had elapsed since his last musical play. In 1956, he'd collaborated with High Craft on the book of Summer Song. Bernard Grun adapted the music of Antonin Dvorak and the play told of a visit the Czech composer made to the United States in 1893. Eric faced a formidable task. Fellow lyricist Ronnie Bridges. To fit uh, a good lyric to a very, very well-known tune, you have to be on your metal and it has to be brilliant, which Eric always was, of course. One boy. Sally Ann Howes singing Eric's lyric for a song originally heard in Dvorak's opera Rusalka and more familiar to us as Song to the Moon. In 1955, Eric had been a major force behind the creation of the Ivor Novello Awards, which acknowledge excellence in British popular music. And there's not much doubt that he would have won one of the coveted bronze statuettes had they been in existence when his lyrics were at their most elegant and poetic. By 1961, Eric's career at the BBC was beginning to wind down. Bill Cotton. By then, Tom Sloan was rearing to go um, uh, as, as head of entertainment. And Eric had really done the job that he'd uh, been brought in to do. And he suggested this idea of him becoming an advisor to the controller. But he'd seen a lot of water under a bridge by then. And, uh, you know, there was a bit of to do with senility as, as much to do with drink. One 
kind of had a tremendous sadness about Eric in some way, because he was a sad figure towards the end of his life. That's the time of day Listening to the music Hearing the colorful play Deep blue evening Watch the big moon rise Count the stars of fallen Angels are sweeping the skies. Angels are sweeping the skies. Edric Connor singing another of the lyrics Eric wrote for Summer Song. He left the BBC in May 1963 and spent a brief period as producer of special projects at Rediffusion, the London-based commercial television company. But soon his health began to fail, as his great friend Eamon Andrews remembered. I was at Eric's last birthday party and it was a sad kind of affair. He'd long since withdrawn into some memory land of his own, and it was only now and then he came out of it to give you that familiar thump on the shoulder that meant he'd taken the point of whatever silly joke you'd made and wasn't going to hurt you by telling you just how silly it was. If he didn't suffer fools gladly, at least he always did graciously. He was a kind character in a world that has more respect for the bitchy and the brash and the brutal. They're difficult times to remember that they both became ill. And they both suffered from uh, a little bit of dementia. And they both went sadly the same way and died in different places, but very close to each other in, in time. We were very close, and I loved him dearly. Crawford Gordon, whose adopted uncle, Eric Mashwitz, passed away 25 years ago this week, aged 68, on the 27th of October, 1969. I went to um, the memorial service in, in uh, St. Martin Field. I was there. A huge turnout. Standing room. But more important even than the, the, the very senior people from the forces, from society, from the music business, the theatre, the West End, from television and radio, was the variety of people from all sorts of walks of life who just simply made time to be there. The number of what I guess and took to be people, cameramen, people from on the sites of theatres and also from studios, just making time to be there. The place was packed. It was a wonderful occasion. I do remember afterwards, some of us went off to a bar and remembered Eric and quite a lot of tears were falling down, quite a lot of faces. When I think of Eric, I think I remember him half getting up out of a chair to welcome somebody. And it could be an old friend, and it could be somebody quite new, but it would always be the same. There would be that very young look on his face as he said hello, as if he hoped we were all in for a nice time. But certain night. The night we met, there was magic abroad in the air. There were angels dining at the Ritz, and a nightingale sang in Barclay Square. I may be right, I may be wrong, but I'm perfectly willing to swell but when you turn and smiled at me and I think I'll sang in Barclay Square the moon 
that lingered over London town Poor puzzled moon, he wore a frown How could he know we two were so in love The whole darned world seemed upside down The streets of town were paved with stars It was such a romantic affair And as we kissed and said goodnight A nightingale sang in Barclay 